Welcome to Park Avenue Plastic Surgery Class, the podcast where we explore controversies and breaking issues in plastic surgery. I'm your co-host, Doreen Wu, a clinical assistant at Bass Plastic Surgery in New York City. I'm excited to be here with Dr. Lawrence Bass, Park Avenue plastic surgeon, educator, and technology innovator. The title of today's episode is Psych Yourself Out, Being Mindful About Plastic Surgery. This episode sounds a bit different. Usually we discuss technical aspects of plastic surgery, what's new, or technological advancements. What's the idea behind this episode, Dr. Bass? That's true, Doreen. Our focus is on explaining which treatments address which aesthetic features, but I also like to spend time talking about decision-making and how to think about your plastic surgery needs. That's a really important thing. Today's episode is an extension of that idea. We're fortunate to have a guest with us who is an expert in this area. Dr. Alan Goodwin is a psychologist in Los Angeles, California. He has spent the past 20 years as a psychotherapist and published his book, Saving Face Without Losing Your Mind, Bringing Mindfulness to Your Cosmetic Procedure. And this book was published this past November of 2022. Dr. Goodwin, welcome to the podcast and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Bass. I'm really uh, happy to be here, eager to talk with you about this. Wonderful. So, Dr. Goodwin, can you tell us a little about what experiences led you to write this book? Well, you know, working in Los Angeles uh, as a psychologist, years ago I began seeing clients who were preparing for or recovering from a cosmetic procedure. Initially, it, it just happened. They, they weren't looking for someone to help them with that, but it, the subject just came up in the therapy. And, you know, effective psychotherapy is often assisted by great self-help books, um, you know, books enable a client to continue the work between sessions, um, and I have shelves of them, but uh, I don't have any book written by a psychologist, or I didn't until now, that specifically uh, directs the work toward helping cosmetic procedure patients. So, you know, a long, long, long time ago, I began writing this book, and that's what it's, uh, that's what it's about. That's what the focus is. Yeah, I think there have been some books in the past that plastic surgeons have written discussing the experience and psychology and decision-making of plastic surgery. But, you know, that's really, from our perspective as surgeons, it's not an expert opinion of a psychotherapist with with decades of experience. So hearing it from that perspective uh, certainly fills an unmet need. Uh, The book has so many useful techniques and interesting human stories. I noticed you draw from cognitive behavioral therapy and meditation techniques. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what what they are and why they're useful? Sure. So I I do practice a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's solution-focused, which means we get to work on key issues right away. It's integrative, which means it integrates ideas and practices that, that Buddhists and other uh, Eastern practitioners uh, have been utilizing for centuries. Um, um, integrative cognitive behavioral therapy um, combines cognitive therapy with behavioral therapy. Cognitive therapy is uh, essentially the idea that Um, If we change the way that we think, that will have a direct impact on the way that we feel and behave. Behavioral therapy is similar, but it it focuses on behaviors. If we change the way we behave, it will have an effect on the way that we think and feel. Um, To combine the two, we focus on both. And so in the book, you probably notice there's a triangular model That's just a a triangle with uh, cognitions and behaviors and thoughts and um, feelings, sorry, on the different uh, three corners with uh, two-sided arrows connecting them. And what it represents is the idea that the way that we think, the way that we feel, and the way that we behave are causally connected to each other. They're not just related, they cause each other. And so we work on, from that uh, uh, fundamental idea in therapy. And 
the emphasis in the in the integrative aspect of, of the work is on the power of the act of mindfulness, being being aware of the way that we're thinking and the way that we're behaving and how that's affecting how we feel. So the work is strengths-based, it's empowerment focused. Um, and you know, we don't always associate compassion with strength and power, but uh, compassion is really actually very empowering. And yeah, meditations are also a tool that's used. You know, it's it's interesting because as you were explaining this, I'm reflecting, and if we change appearance and we feel good about our appearance, that's that's part of that triangular double arrow interrelationship. So it's one mechanism for for impacting the balance in some regard. Sure. Yeah. And and the reason that it it uh, becomes a problem at times, as I'm sure you're well aware, is uh, some people um, after cosmetic procedures and and before cosmetic procedures, some people are just way too demanding on themselves and on other people, and they're very difficult to please. And so um, that's why um, a lot of that's one of the reasons a, a lot of people struggle with the process of preparing for and then recovering from a cosmetic procedure. But we can talk about some of those problems uh, during the time we're talking. Yeah, that, that's actually a really interesting point because something I often say to my patients, they'll show me some little feature and almost apologize. I'm sorry, this is just a little thing, but to me, it's a big deal. And I usually tell them, listen, don't, don't apologize. Plastic surgeons by temperament are perfectionists and plastic surgery patients by temperament are perfectionists. So it's a good, it's a good meeting when we get together. Uh, but again, you have to avoid going overboard with that because you can work yourself into a frenzy uh, over things that can't readily be changed. Uh, and you have to enjoy the things that can be changed and be satisfied on some level with that to avoid making yourself too preoccupied. Yeah, and it's a, a, a great way of talking about this is to use the, the concept of perfectionism. Because if we think of it in its purest form, perfectionism is, is more of a black and white uh, concept. Um, we humans are not perfect. And so if we're perfectionistic, we think of it as a way to do very, very well. Psychologically, because we're not perfect, Perfectionism is a way to ensure that we'll feel inadequate. So we want to strive, but we really don't want perfectionism. Right. That's a good point. I mean, it, it, it's like the relentless pursuit of perfection, but we have to accept that we're never going to achieve it. And we have to find a way to live with that. That's right. And that's a good example of what happens in psychotherapy. We, we, we might tease apart at times, what is this about? You know, first we identify the perfectionism. The next step is, so this is kind of self-abusive because you are perpetuating this feeling inside you, this way of thinking about yourself that's connected to inadequacy. And it's, it's abusive. And where did this ever come from? And you, it's, another, it's also a great example of how cognitive uh, therapy is used. We're, we're not... Uh, a, the objective in that kind of a situation isn't to convince the person to have low standards. The objective is to just tweak those standards a little bit so that they're more realistic and not abusive. Yeah, I mean, I, I say over and over on the podcast that I really like people to be realist about what plastic surgery can do for them. We want try to represent those realities and the notion of, as I said in the introduction, of how to think about your plastic surgery is really important to being an, an effective, satisfied consumer of plastic surgery instead of uh, not, getting, not getting where you're trying to go. And now, you speak a fair amount um, about a particular word, and it's in the subtitle of your book, mindfulness. 
Can you define what you mean by that in general and specifically in the context of deciding to have plastic surgery? Yeah, it's an important uh, uh, part of the aspect of the book, and I appreciate having the chance to, to describe how it's used in psychotherapy because in some ways, uh, I, I talk about things a little bit differently than the Buddhists do. I give a lot of credit to them, but here's an example. Mindfulness is usually defined by Buddhist thinkers as awareness without judgment. In psychotherapy, I encourage clients to think of it as awareness without that qualifier, because what we're doing when we're mindful is we're being aware of the way that we're thinking and feeling in any given moment. And we do tend to be judgmental at times, at least at times. And we need to be aware of the judgment. Um, and uh, that's really what one of the things that we work out in the therapy. So that's what mindfulness is, is, about, is about. It's about observing yourself. And one way that, that clients can begin, oftentimes they, they say, you know, how do I begin? How do I use this? Is to think of this as a tool in your back pocket that you can pull out throughout any given day. And what you could start noticing is your own judgments, your judgments about how you appear, your judgments about other people, how they appear, about your performance, about how other people behave, anything that you're evaluating throughout the day. Again, and again, we're not, we're, the objective isn't to become someone who has no opinion. The objective is to become more reasonable. And so I define compassion as viewing other people within the context of their struggle. And self-compassion would be viewing yourself within the context of your struggle. So you're, you're not supposed to not see bad behavior in other people. But if you see the struggle that's uh, fueling their bad behavior... You don't tend to personalize it as much. And if you don't personalize it as much, you're not as um, impacted by it. You don't like it, but you're not deeply wounded by it. That makes sense. And, and in the context of deciding about plastic surgery, how do you work around the concept of awareness with your patients? Well, I, I think what one of the things that's important to look at is um, what they're uh, expecting out of the procedure, but also whether the expectations are really rising above a mere expectation. You hear people casually talk about how we shouldn't have expectations. I don't know where that ever got started, but it sounds good, but it really isn't the problem. If I go to a movie, I should expect to enjoy it. If I'm really deeply disappointed and outraged if I didn't like the movie, what's happening that's the problem inside me is not that I expected to enjoy it, it's that I demanded that I enjoy it. So likewise, if someone is preparing for a plastic uh, procedure and they have these rigid, narrow demands for outcomes, they're really setting themselves up for being really anxious uh, during the recovery process and for being displeased at the end, because as you know, um, outcomes are somewhat unpredictable, somewhat predictable, but somewhat unpredictable. And the more rigid and narrow their demands are, the more likely um, they're, they're not going to be pleased with the outcome. That makes sense. So let's, let's drill down a little bit to some specifics about plastic surgery and, and We've started to talk about this with the concept of awareness and, and being demanding, but who's a good candidate psychologically for plastic surgery? I, I would say there's someone who knows what they like and what they dislike and what they want and what they don't want, but they're reasonable in their expectations about those things. They're, they're not coming into the process with a sense of a demand, a set of demands. They practice acceptance often. This means um, they won't tend to overreact um, either to pleasant or unpleasant experiences in life. I guess we could say they tend to be more optimistic, not so cynical. Um, uh, they tend to be more compassionate and forgiving. These are the qualities that uh, a patient would want to enhance in themselves. And these are the kinds of things that 
the exercises in the book and what I do with clients in, in the office are aimed at achieving. Is there a distinction between expectations of how you'll look after plastic surgery and expectations of how your life will be different after plastic surgery? Well, they tend to be a function of each other. And, you know, the good news is they do tend to uh, be related to each other. You know, plastic surgery is achieving amazing things for people. Um, the, the problem is people do need to keep, keep themselves grounded and uh, have realistic expectations. They're going to need to do uh, some, some work in terms of changing their life if their life is going to change. Their appearance won't, um, won't achieve it alone. Right. I mean, let me give an example. I, if I do a breast augmentation almost for certain that, you know, patient may like it, they may not like it, or they may like it a little or a lot, but pretty much for sure their breasts are going to be bigger, but that's not necessarily going to change their relationship with their significant other. It might, but it, it might not. And appearance is a vehicle for improved life, but it, it doesn't necessarily connect linearly or, or in a direct linkage with making your life better, aside from the appearance, self-confidence aspect. Sure. It's, it's, it's a great example of how complicated it can become. Because if we just take that example, um, the woman might feel better about the way she looks and her partner may treat her differently. And that may cause the patient to resent that they were treated uh, less well before. And that can create a whole other process, th issue for them to process together. So, you know, how people react to being treated differently is a whole other dynamic that you, you're probably aware of, but that we deal with in uh, psychotherapy. How, how, one of the reasons it's hard to change in psychotherapy is um, you know you know who you are. You know, if I'm going to change and be more confident, I, one of the reasons it's difficult is I, I've never been confident in this or that setting. What would that look like? And that's some of the work that we do in therapy. What would it look like if you weren't concerned about this or that aspect of yourself if you were at a food court, you know? Um, it takes some time adjusting afterward. So this is why I thought the book was so important to write because a lot of people don't think about that. They're not prepared for um, how am I going to interact in the world when the world is looking at me differently? I have practiced being who I've been. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I think it illustrates how psychotherapy and some of the techniques you discuss in your book can really amplify the benefit you get from having a plastic surgery because you will understand better how to make use of it, how to react to it. That's really fascinating. Uh, you started to address this issue and talking about overly demanding people, but are there personality types or circumstances where, <clears throat> in general, plastic surgery might be a bad idea? Yeah, it's a tough, touchy subject. You know, I, I, I try to deal with it uh, carefully in the book because um, I, I am disinclined to tell someone that they should or should not have a, a procedure. And, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know whether a patient is going to have a, a real difficult time coping with the outcome. But, yeah, there are some characteristics. There's a P-test that I have in the book, which is a test for prickliness. And it's really about these qualities that I mentioned earlier. How reactive are we? I think prickly is a great descriptive for people, for some people, because they're like roses. You know, they, they remind you that if you rush to them uh, without being careful, you're, you're going to uh, be injured. So um, the, these are people that we tend to walk on eggshells around because we just get a sense that they're, they have prickers. So that's one. 
Another is uh, something that I call the appearance self-consciousness measure. And it just uh, lists a, a bunch of situations, I think there are nine, um, and asks you to rate how self-conscious you tend to be when you're, for instance, eating in public or when you see an attractive person. How, or, how, how much of a tendency do you have to think about your own appearance and how you sort of stack up? Um, so those are, are characteristics and a red flag that the patient or physicians could look out for are um, but patients who have who feel very intense needs for a, a particular outcome. What I discuss in the book is also the idea of a patient treating the surgeon like they are a savior. That should be a red flag. And it's difficult. It's difficult for psychologists to resist that. It feels good when someone's treating you like you're a savior. <laughs> but it's you, you should have, you know, a voice inside you saying, you know, danger, Will Robinson. Because um, you aren't a savior. You know, you may be very helpful. I may be very helpful. But if someone's treating me like a savior, it's a sign that they tend to overreact. And those people tend to rebound in the other direction and feel abandoned or feel um, betrayed when really something just went wrong in spite of someone intending it to go well. And uh, so... We can, we can work on these things in therapy. And that's really the important message that I keep wanting to make sure that I repeat. Effective psychotherapy can help people with these tendencies. And, you know, that's really interesting for me as a surgeon because I went into my field to make people happy. I, I don't want to do procedures for people who aren't prepared properly, aren't don't have the right mindset to have a good experience. And I meter patients very carefully and often tell patients, no, it's not time or this is not a big enough issue that it's worth what's involved in doing the surgery. And patients are often very taken aback by that. It's very hard to tell a patient no. Uh, but I try to point out to patients it's not good. I like operating. That's why I became a surgeon. It's good for my bank account when I operate. If I'm saying no, there, there's nothing in it for me. It's, it's all for the benefit of the patient. Um, and a surgical experience, even in a field like plastic surgery, where I spend much more time with my patients than other kinds of surgeons, and where there's a lot more support and interpersonal dynamics in, in the doctor-patient relationship than with many other kinds of surgeons, it still doesn't really permit the kind of protracted analysis and reflection that psychotherapy will. So someone who's not ready or is not coming at it from a good perspective probably would benefit from that approach rather than jumping ahead to a surgery. Yeah, for sure. And and one of the really positive things that is happening is these support groups are cropping up uh, where patients online are talking amongst themselves. And of course, uh, there are problems with that. You know, misinformation can get passed uh, from person to person. But um, one of the good things that's happening is people are talking about um, whether they're psychologically prepared for certain aspects of the process. And something that I've been exposed to is some patients saying, you know, I just don't understand why the plastic surgeon didn't help me with this. And a number of times I've said to them, well, okay, you know, I can understand, but, you know, you have to remember that is not their field. You know, they can be compassionate, but they're not there to do psychotherapy. And uh, so that's why it's helpful to, to see a therapist. And I'm hoping that the book will help, will give um, plastic surgeons more of, a, a, of an awareness of the need to encourage the patients to um, look out for these issues before the surgery. Because you've probably seen there, um, there, are, um, there are predictable reactions that people have in the um, recovery period. And it 
they really do benefit if they prepare for those, the anxiety and what, what comes with that. Yeah, it's interesting. You know you're going to have bruising and swelling. You know you may not look your best immediately after surgery. You know that in the abstract ahead of time, but when you actually see it looking in the mirror on your own body, it feels very different than thinking about it abstractly in advance. Yeah, there's a really simple idea um, that, that, that is intuitive, but we don't, I think we don't think about it enough. Um, if you're in pain, anything psychological is more difficult to cope with. And pain should be defined broadly. If you're in any form of discomfort, so that could even be itching. It could be restriction. You know, um, when you're healing, you, you want, your doctor is probably going to tell you to move, um, but the doctor is also going to tell you to rest. And you may not want to be resting so much. So even resting can be um, unpleasant for people, but pain absolutely can be unpleasant. So um, in that context, um, seeing the bruising and seeing the, uh, the swelling and, and whatever else uh, can be more difficult to cope with. Next, let's imagine this scenario. I'm someone who is thinking about getting some plastic surgery done, but I'm not quite sure if it's the right decision. How should I decide? If I have some doubt, does that mean I shouldn't go through with this? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, I mean, I think um, it's, it's normal to have doubt because there's, um, uh, there's uncertainty. Um, and so it really depends whether you should go through with it. It depends on a lot of factors. It depends um, how intense the doubts are. It depends on how intense the desired results are. Also depends on how disappointing the you know, undesirable results might be for you. You know, all of these issues can be managed with effective psychotherapy. Um, so there's, you know, the problem is there's no certainty with cosmetic procedures, and there's especially no certainty because um, success is subjective. And so that's why you want to be careful to find a physician whose aesthetic matches your aesthetic. And just in general, this, is, uh, this involves uncertainty and risk is scary, um, but it's tolerable if we think in balanced, rational ways, and that's what the cognitive part of the work in psychotherapy is about. You know, I, I have a yardstick that I use when I talk to patients because it is natural to have some doubt. It, it's different from trauma surgery where you're in an in accident and bleeding to death and you have to do something. And people always ask the question, should I really be doing this? There's always a little bit of guilt. Why am I doing something medical when I'm not forced to because of an illness? Uh, so that's natural. Uh, that by itself shouldn't keep you from doing it. But I, what I ask patients to do is to think about the, the following. If there's a feature that they see and I see that's causing them distress, they don't like it, they want to change it. I have a good way to improve it that's reliable, not a guarantee exactly as Dr. Goodwin said, because nothing we do in life is 100% guaranteed. This is no different. But if I have a good way to improve it and the goal of improvement is realistic, then I ask people, I say it's probably reasonable to go ahead. And I ask people to say, look, you know in your gut, you know, there's an impulse buy. You know, if we had the magic wand, there might be 50 things you would change about your appearance, but we don't have a magic wand. We have to do it the real world way. So if there's something that bugs you, every time you look in the mirror, every time you're getting ready to go out, every time you see a picture of yourself, you're probably not going to let go of that. You're probably going to do it sooner or, or later. So if it's one of those things that in your core really bothers you and we have a reliable way to improve it, then it's probably reasonable to go ahead. And I, I you know, I would just add that um, there, there was a, a study, I tried not to put too much research in the book, um, but but there was a, a really interesting study, I thought, out of Finland. I think the title of it was A Second Youth, and it was kind of um, 
an ironic title because it was um, it involved interviews. So it was qualitative research in Finland of about 20, 22, something like that, um, individuals over 55 who had uh, some sort of cosmetic procedure. I think they were all facial procedures. What was interesting about it was in interviewing these people, um, they were not talking about wanting to look 30. They were talking about broader ideas like wanting to remain relevant, wanting to remain professionally active, and wanting to counter some of the um, um, ways that that, uh, ageism limits us socially and professionally. They were wanting to eliminate uh, the appearance of certain emotions that they felt um, were on their face, even though they didn't feel them. They were wanting to look um, optimistic because they felt optimistic. And they were looking in the mirror and not feeling like they were looking the way they were feeling. They wanted to look energetic and people were, were perceiving them to be tired. And so I, I just think it's, it's um, interesting to add, um, one of the things we do in psychotherapy is, is validate that, you know, it isn't always in your head, you know? We can deal with the stuff that's in your head, but, but oftentimes what's happening is there's a reality basis to what you're experiencing. People are treating you a certain way. And so, you know, I don't talk people into or out of procedures, like I said, but I think this was a powerful study because it honors that um, there, there are understandable reasons why people would have procedures that are not just about, you know, vanity. Yeah, and I, I this happens to me all the time. It's very interesting, that study, and it matches very closely a, a lot of clinical experiences that I have talking with patients. Uh, a lot of patients apologize for their vanity, and uh, if there's one place you really don't have to apologize for that, it's at the plastic surgeon's office because we're on board with it. Um, but... Patients say to me, I say, you know, I can't make you look 20 again. And they say, oh, I don't need to look 20. But when they look exactly as you said, when they look worn, when they look like they don't have energy, that doesn't play well in your personal life. It doesn't play well in the workplace. It really doesn't matter who you are or what you do. Uh, In America, we like go-getters and people who are positive and upbeat. And if you're appearance does not project that, that works against you. And that's very real. In the best of all possible worlds, it wouldn't be that way. But definitively, this is the real world, not the best of all possible worlds. And it does work that way. Uh, So I tell patients, we're trying to get you to this adult indeterminate stage. You know, there are certain telltales in appearance that will peg you in a certain decade of life or at a certain decade or older. And if we can take some of those away, people may look at you and they know you're not 20. That's okay. But they can't say, oh, well, obviously they're in their 60s or obviously they're a senior or obviously they just know you look good and you look like you. Because rejuvenation and changing who you look like are both things we do in plastic surgery, but at different times for different reasons for different patients. Earlier, Dr. Goodwin, you brought up feelings of doubt related to uncertainty and the unknown, which makes me wonder, what is your take on patients getting a second opinion or even a third opinion from other providers? Is it worth the trouble? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I I think so. Uh, But in the book, I described a way that, you know, second and third opinions and um, searches online for uh, before and after photos can become counterproductive. Uh, They can reveal other underlying issues that we would look at in in psychotherapy. Um, Some things really should be resolved before the surgery because the recovery process is going to exacerbate and expose um, psychological vulnerabilities, like I, I mentioned before. So second and third opinions are good, but at a certain point, you know, it's it, it's important to come to a decision. And sometimes people just become 
uh, they, they just feel like they're swimming in opinions by experts that, you know, are all um, uh, expressing very strong opinions, but, but the opinions are, are um, not consistent with one another. So what if these recommendations don't match? Won't that only make the patient more confused? Yeah, it, it may. That's the problem, you know. And, and if it happens, the answer isn't necessarily to avoid the procedure. The answer may be to continue to consult, but to look for a different expert who can help them sift through the contradictory advice. I see that very often. I think it's a good idea to see several surgeons. I like it when patients do that. I like patients who are consumerist and thinking about things. I feel I work best with with someone who tries to be informed that way. But I find very often patients are very confused and very anxious when the recommendations of the different surgeons don't match. And, it, you know, it's this notion of there's got to be one absolute best way of doing things. And in reality, most surgeons refine their techniques to where they can get an outstanding result in their hands based on their experience and their techniques. You know, there are techniques that are well outside the mainstream. I'm not suggesting going there, but surgeons who are experienced to do a procedure frequently are getting excellent results can usually explain to you why they choose their technique, which doesn't mean that that the other technique is wrong or bad. It just means they can get a great result with their technique. So looking at the technique is important, understanding it, being comfortable with it and what it's going to mean in terms of recovery and so forth but also looking at a surgeon who you feel comfortable with, who you feel you'll enjoy working with, who you feel is listening to you and hearing your concerns. Because if the surgeon hears your concerns, they can do whatever is humanly possible to try to address them. But if they're not listening to you or they have a cookie cutter approach, the chance that they're going to match up with what you're looking to have done is not certainly not as good. So that's how I suggest patients try to deal with some of the confusion and and anxiety when they get a few opinions and they're not matching up. I think that's really great advice, especially finding a surgeon who you feel like is listening to you and is curious about what you're looking for. So now that leads me to my next question. I have made my decision to undergo plastic surgery, but how should I pick a surgeon? Is bedside manner more important or should I focus on their technical skill and experience? Uh, So I wonder what Dr. Bass would say. I would say you should definitely focus on bedside manner and technical skill and experience. (laughs) Um, I just, I I would think... um, we need to find um, a balance among all of those. And um, uh, of course, you know, the chapter that I address this in finding the right surgeon, in that chapter, I, I talk about how it, it really is difficult. A lot of patients report that they have a really difficult time because they're not surgeons. Um, and most surgeons will describe the work that they do with confidence. And so I, I like the idea of consulting uh, a specialist who doesn't perform that kind of cosmetic work um, and asking them who they would recommend and what they should what they think you should look for. So the example I give in the book is um, an ophthalmologist who doesn't do blepher, blepharoplasties might be a great person to consult um, um, because they've seen um, outcomes from um, um, people who do that work. Yeah, I think it's it's challenging because there are a lot of people trying to deliver these services these days and there are there's a very high noise level on the internet, on social media 
uh, on providers' websites. Uh, I mean, the marketing that's going on uh, by the marketing professionals within the field of plastic surgery and aesthetic medicine is very aggressive. And it, it detracts from the key features which are training, technical skill and experience, and and bedside manner, really the doctor-patient relationship. Um, what The way I think about it is I am looking to do A-plus plastic surgery. This is elective. Patients don't have to do it. I have to be sure I can do it as reliably as possible as safely as possible because it's elective there's no wiggle room i i can't again be perfect because that's not human but i have to be as close as i can given the circumstances and so that means everything everything about how i work with patients how my staff works with patients how the office manages things and gets people through the experience everything has to be a plus there's no area that you can slack off in okay so now that i followed the process i picked a surgeon and i'm going for it i'm getting a little nervous though about the surgery itself and the recovery and how i'm going to look at the end Will I get a good result? Will I look my look, will I look like myself by the end? Will I like it or wish I'd never gotten into this in the first place? I thought I'd feel calmer once I decided, but now I'm more anxious than ever. What should I do? It's a really important question. I mean, if there's one thing I would want listeners to take from this podcast, it's that there's a common set of reactions that patients have before and after procedures. And there are ways to um, prepare yourself for those reactions. You you may not have all of them. You may not have them as intensely as other people. But if you prepare ahead of time, you're going to handle them better than you would if you didn't prepare. So that's why at the end of the book, I have a chapter that provides meditations, 14 meditations, one per day before the surgery and 14, one per day uh, for the 14 days after the day of the procedure. And I say in the book that you can do them in any order, but I present them in roughly the order that I expect a patient to need them. Each each meditation focuses on a different aspect of the experience. So fear, excitement, um, um, uncertainty, different things that people tend to experience and um, oftentimes struggle with. And so, you know, the message is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy really does work. If you've had that and it's been ineffective, you know, try to trust that you do need to try again. No therapist is helpful for every client, uh, but there are many therapists who are really very skilled and can help you learn some pretty simple and yet really effective tools that often help you to begin to feel better, feel more resilient and more hopeful, you know, very soon after beginning the work. Those are all great points. And that leads me to my final kind of overarching question. Is plastic surgery a good thing? Can it make me happy? Or should I just get over it and learn to love myself the way I am? I think essentially, I'm wondering, what are the benefits of plastic surgery to me as a person? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I feel like I, I need to be careful because I really don't want to be um, seeming to be coming down on either side of, you know, whether this particular person should or shouldn't have a procedure. Um, But, you know, the fact is there's a lot of really positive research um, that's come out um, connected to plastic surgery. I mean, enhanced self-esteem, improved body image, satisfaction with the decision to have the procedure is very high. Um, Patients have reported, you know, seeking to appear more youthful, like I said, and and then experiencing that and experiencing people treating them differently. Um, so there really is no question that it can help. But, you know, there are complications and there are also people who um, are looking for things that plastic surgery isn't going to provide. And so that's where, you know, being mindful and either using a book like this or uh, finding a therapist or doing both um, really is a prudent way 
to approach it and make it more likely that you're going to you're going to find what you're looking for. I, I think that's a great a great way to look at it. I mean, I, there's no doubt in my mind, having done this for more than 25 years, that that plastic surgery in the right individual can do a tremendous amount to enhance confidence, self-esteem. Uh, it, it really can be a tremendously positive thing. But being grounded, being realistic, you know, kind of analyzing the realities and making sure it's a good fit for you is very important. Um, and the, the saying about that is, is plastic surgery makes happy people happier, but it might more generally be, be said that plastic surgery for the right person can make you happier, but you have to ask yourself if what plastic surgery can deliver is, is going to fit that bill. I think that makes a lot of sense. Finally, before we conclude, Dr. Goodwin, what should our listeners take away from today's episode? Well, I'm not sure what to add other than, uh, you know, there are methods for coping. Uh, it's you know, we can't say that you're going to struggle, but we can say that um, struggling at different points of the process, you know, choosing the procedure, um, preparing for it, and then recovering from it, um, struggling is common, and uh, there are tools for managing it. So I think that's the, really the, the takeaway that I would want to keep emphasizing. Um, and remember that you're going to be reacting within the context of, of physical discomfort. It, you know, it may not be a lot of pain, uh, but there will probably be some discomfort and there will also be limitations. And just remember that, you know, we do tend to have more difficulty coping when we have something, some kind of discomfort um, uh, layered on top of something psychological going on. And we're going to be in a context of uncertainty about something that's important to us. So there are a number of things that are happening after a procedure, and that's why it's a good idea to prepare ahead of time. Dr. Bass, any parting words? Well, in plastic surgery, we want to make people happy. We want, to the extent that it's possible, to try to give you the result that you want in a pleasant, comfortable, empowering experience. It, it can be very important empowering to take control of your appearance and craft your self-image the way you you wish. Uh, at the same time, you have to make a realistic assessment. You have to have realistic expectations about the experience and the result, and, and you're committing yourself to the necessary components of that experience, the recovery, the discomfort, the, the activity limitations, exactly as Dr. Goodwin said. Uh, but it can give you tremendous self-confidence and positivity in both social and work interactions and a different sense of self. Uh, at the same time, if you're having difficulties leading up to or recovering from a procedure, I think, as Dr. Goodwin pointed out, the ability of psychotherapy, the ability of various techniques that he discusses in his book to help you cope with those things and make the most positive experience out of it is something important to remember that those tools are available. Uh, there was a surgeon, Tagliacozzi. Uh, he was a pioneering plastic surgeon in the 16th century in nasal reconstruction. And his image appears on the seal of the American Board of Plastic Surgery on our board certificates. And to, pra to paraphrase him, he said, we repair and restore, not so that it please the eye of the beholder, but so that it buoy the spirit of the patient. And I think that's really what we're trying to do in plastic surgery. It's, it's almost more about the psychological impact on someone than it is about the physical alteration in their appearance. Definitely. A very appropriate quote to close our discussion today. 
Thank you, Dr. Goodwin and Dr. Bass, for sharing your insight and expertise on this fascinating aspect of how plastic surgery really impacts us psychologically. And I'd like to thank Dr. Goodwin for joining us for this fascinating discussion. I think, you know, so many really thoughtful, impactful points about how to be mindful approaching plastic surgery. Uh, If you enjoyed the discussion and want to learn more, you can read Dr. Goodwin's excellent book, Saving Face Without Losing Your Mind, Bringing Mindfulness to Your Cosmetic Procedure. It's very thorough and has a very worthwhile discussion of this topic. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk with you about this. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Park Avenue Plastic Surgery Class Podcast. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, write a review, and share the show with your friends. Be sure to join us next time to avoid missing all the great content that's coming your way. If you want to contact us with comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at podcast at drbass.net or DM us on Instagram at drbassnyc.com.